Are you ready to revolutionize your relationship with money? Welcome to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast with The Frugal Position, where Dr. Disha Spath will be your companion on this exciting financial adventure. Get ready to conquer debt, build wealth, and embrace a mindful spending lifestyle that will empower you to live life on your own terms. Pearson Rabbit's story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then, a shoulder injury struck during a precipitous delivery. Her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company determined to approach insurance differently. Together, they set their mission to educate and empower physicians to protect their most valuable asset, their income and the most important people in their life, their family. Today, Pearson Rabbits serves the medical community in all 50 states. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand the unique concerns of physicians. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning and guidance, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com to schedule your consultation with a Pearson Rabbits advisor. Welcome back to Finding Financial Freedom with the Frugal Physician. I'm your host, Dr. Disha Spath. Dr. Nirav Shah is back with us. As you may remember, he's a board-certified neurologist, a stroke expert, and recently invested in The Physician on Fire. We're going to talk about his medical expert witness course and medical expert witness work in general. I know I am pretty ignorant about what goes into that. I'm really interested to see what he has to say about medical expert witness work and why he's putting together this course. Full disclosure, we don't have an affiliate relationship with Physician on Fire. I'm not saying that's not going to happen in the future, but right now, Dr. Shah is in the early stages of putting this course together. I wanted to have him on to get his thoughts on this really interesting field and have you hear what the process is like when you're putting something together like this, like a course on something that might be helpful to physicians. So let's get into it. Hey, Dr. Shah, welcome back. Hi, Disha. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure. I love talking to you and I love seeing all the stuff you're up to at Physician on Fire. And really excited to talk to you today about the medical expert witness course that you've put together. You told me about this during our last conversation, and I really thought this would be an interesting topic to cover on this podcast because, frankly, I don't know anything about medical expert witness work. I don't know how you get into it, how much it pays, and, you know, why people would want to do it. I mean, actually, you know, I'm all for side gigs, but I have to tell you, courtrooms scare me. (laughs) And I think for most doctors, you know, the word lawyer induces reflux. So let's start with what initially drew you into medical expert witness work and how it impacted your career. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking and thanks for having me back. I think I was telling you about how I recently went to a trial as an expert witness. And we can talk about that more and kind of how unique that was an experience and like all things, it's kind of lifelong learning and a different experience. But yeah, it is unique and I could understand why people would be stressed. I'll tell you how I got involved. I had been in expensive cities throughout most of my training, Miami, then San Francisco, and then moved to Seattle, which is also mm-hmm. an example, albeit cheaper than San Francisco at the time. And I had significant debts. I had a good job, but I wanted to pay them off. Some of my former mentors at University of California had done these cases and it's kind of a collegial thing they would pass them on and that's initially how i got it okay so your mentors were doing it these were people you trusted and you kind of saw them go through the process and they passed them on to you tell me about the first case that you got and how you learned what to do the first issue was you know they had to coach me on things that are kind of not things that we commonly talk about fee schedules and how to get paid and it's not something that's well publicized even now, almost a decade later, it's pretty hard to figure out what you should charge, what's market rate, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Whereas the rest of the world has transitioned into a world of transparency where people talk pretty openly, increasingly about their income. Yeah. And so that was the first challenge where one of them pulled me into an office and said, you know, you can never talk about this publicly, of course, right? And 
here's roughly what people like us make doing this kind of work and build your way up and build a bit of a track record. The reason why they'd refer to it is they had too many, right? If you're at an academic center, probably with some prestige and some history, you can't take on every case, you're just busy. It was another way for them to give back to people who, you know, ostensibly had incomes that weren't consistent with the rising cost of the city, right? If you think about San Francisco at that time, the muni drivers were making around 95,000 fellows were making under 60 at this point in time. That might've changed wow. now. I know it's all gone up, but it's yeah. still pretty far behind what a public worker would even make just to use an exact mm -hmm. comparable. It was their way of kind of just helping us kind of do more than to survive, basically. So tell me the numbers. Do you feel comfortable sharing the numbers? Yeah, yeah, of course. It totally depends on expertise. So at the time, this was years ago now, the hourly rate was probably 400 per hour for okay. this type of work on average. And now I've kind of corroborated that. If you're in a more intense field or more of a niche field like surgery, even things like pathology, like a unique subspecialty of pathology, like neuropathology, the rates are much higher. The rates are more like paid hundred dollars an hour. So it's meaningful because in many of these cases, like let's just use this histopathology example I just gave, a neuropathologist would have to read some slides. They'd have to get those. They'd have to find time to look at them. Same with radiology. The ranges are pretty high and I'm confident they're much higher if you're the expert at something, if you're the person that's written about X, Y, Z in mm -hmm. the literature and people will come find you when there is a case about that topic. And how many hours do you usually spend on a case? Yeah, this is a great question. So on average, and I've done many now, the typical case has a certain anatomy to it. The beginning of the case is an initial review to make sure that you as a physician feel like you're consistent with what the lawyer is asking you to review. Just like we would ask another fellow physician as a consult. The subsequent part of the discussion then is creating a report. This varies state by state. Some states require a report. Some states you can't write a report and submit it because then it becomes part of the record. And there's some gamesmanship around this that every jurisdiction has to manage. And that total initial review to report generation is roughly three to 10 hours, minimum three. If it's just a curbside consult, then they give you three notes, maybe an ED note, a discharge note, and maybe an image in my case as a neurologist, read, and then they might send you more files. And if something goes to trial, it's many, many hours. We're jumping ahead a bit, but when something goes to trial and it becomes many, many hours, I'm assuming you actually have to go to the courtroom. That's right. And how do you make well, time for that? That's changed well, since COVID. Initially, you would definitely go into a courthouse for any depositions, which is basically an interview with lawyers from both sides involved and a stenographer and other people. In the courtroom, of course, it's what you kind of expect on TV, pretty normal, demure proceedings. How do you make time is the question. I think that's one of the unique issues if someone is to pursue this. They need to have flexible schedules. If you're involved in acute care, you'd have to manage your schedule such that you can be there for the trial. The system has changed quite a bit since COVID. I don't know if you recall this, but there are some funny memes of one lawyer accidentally turned himself into a cat using some face filter that kind of went viral in the mobile proceeding and couldn't change it. So Zoom has been adopted during these, <laughs> which I think is the meaningful change now. Yeah. Because traveling to a courthouse can be pretty meaningful to be there for trial. Trials are often delayed. Our yeah. court system in this country is pretty backlogged. And so even in the case that I had been to trial in, it was delayed. And so I just sat around for a half hour in the courthouse, which wasn't the best experience. Or I'm not complaining because of course I was compensated for the time, but it wasn't my favorite use of the time to sit around and not have access to anything. Oh, you can't even work on charts while you're waiting. You know, I was, I felt like I was there to do one thing. And so right. I didn't look distracted or seem like I wasn't committed. Okay. So you were just about to tell us about the first case that you got. Yeah. Let's hop back into that. Tell me about that experience and if you ended up in court. And let's take a quick step back about even the work itself. I think one of the things that even as I was taking on the first case, people close to me, family, friends, et cetera, adult mentors would say, well, lawyers are kind of not our friends, generally speaking. And so do you really want to work for the bad guys? A frame of reference you'd hear in formal conversation. And as physicians, as you know, we probably are averse to lawyers, given the field that we're in and all the concerns we have and how much fear mongering there is about medical malpractice liability throughout all our training. And so that was my first concern. The way I got comfortable with it was 
that I wanted to ensure, I was talking about standard of care, that I wasn't directly antagonizing any specific physician, which I think was important for me. I wasn't interested in taking on a case that was what I call doc on doc crime, where one doc is, you know, did something wrong and here I am trying to antagonize them and, you know, shake them up for money. That wasn't my goal at all. So the first case was about a thrombectomy, acute stroke case. And the question was, was standard of care breached? In this case, it wasn't. I was on the defense side supporting the hospital and this neurologist and interventional team. And so I felt pretty comfortable about defending in that case. I didn't have a conflict with the system of care. Mm -hmm. And so often they want someone who's in a facility or training setup that's similar to the mm -hmm. defendant in this case, the physician and the hospital system. And so I felt pretty good about that one. It sounds like you can pick and choose what case you want to take on. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, definitely, you know, the moral obligation. Doctors, you know, like you said, doc on doc crime is not something anyone ever wants to commit. And going into this, going into courtrooms with lawyers, I always pictured, you know, antagonizing another doctor. And it's good to know that, you know, that there are opportunities to also support our field. Of course, people that are grossly negligent should be held accountable. I'm not saying that we should cover up mistakes either. But yeah, I guess it's nice to know that you can still feel morally satisfied, I guess, doing this work. Yeah. I mean, we do plenty of complicated things where we don't feel like we're always getting the best outcome, whether it's fighting with an insurance to get the right medication or procedure for a patient. Adding this to one's plate, you do want to make sure you're you're clear headed about it, what your yeah. goals are. And obviously there are two sides of each of these cases. There is always a physician on the other side. And so there is someone out there who's willing to take the other side typically. And I think it's on us as physicians to make sure that we just maintain our moral integrity regardless. Right. So if you right. have a trouble, I just tell the lawyer that I agree or I don't agree, or that there is no standard of care in some cases, right? It's not clear what the standard should be. And you know, I'll give you another quick example. There was some patient with a complicated spinal process that was eventually turned out to be an abscess, but it wasn't very obvious initially. Mm -hmm. And there were all these complexities because it was a Friday and then transferring this patient from a tertiary site to a primary site via flight. And there are delays in care. But the right. question was really a delay. And so I think that's where you could imagine two physicians articulating the nuances, but yeah. not this breaking any moral boundary because it is vague. It is unclear at times and it's, you know, there are two points of view. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, working in the hospital, I've definitely seen that kind of thing happen. And, you know, medicine's not perfect as much as we all try to do the right thing. There are delays and transport is an issue, you know. I find that fascinating that doctors can help and impact patients and doctors in a positive way by doing medical malpractice work. What drove you to put together the course that you are currently promoting? Yeah, that's a great question. One of the reasons why we want to put it together is because one, I think there's a lack of knowledge. There's mm -hmm. general some stigmas like we've discussed. People don't know that even in this context, I'll add, add one more quick story. Many of the cases I now take on because I can pick and choose are patient centric, where the most recent one, you know, a patient got stuck in a facility with a long rehab course in the context of a complicated set of neurological conditions and mm -hmm. general medical comorbidities. And they had a Medicaid lien placed on them because insurance didn't want to pay for the stay. And there was a fight between insurance effectively and the patient. The patient couldn't pay the bill. It just became very complicated because the patient was dropped and some other issues happened complicating their stay. And we were able to resolve that. And so that was really cool like where you can really help a patient too. Explain a Medicaid lien to me. Yeah, I didn't even know this was a thing either, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know this could happen prior to this as well. But let's say you're disabled and have mm -hmm. Medicaid. If you can't pay the bill that you owe, the copay, apparently Medicaid can place a lien. Insurance companies can place liens, which is new to me. And so I a big understand. part of this was just resolving the lien on their estate effectively. Wow. I'm going to admit my ignorance here. I didn't even know people on Medicaid had out-of-pocket expenses. Yeah. Yeah, they do have some, especially if you overstand the stay in a facility. So this is like the acute care. Yeah, I know. This is why this gets complicated, right? Because things right. Are, how would we even know? No. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We don't know until the patients bring us their bills, right? And that's not very often. 
So coming back to the course, these are the types of things, right? That even that I don't think I've known and I don't think I would have known given yeah. how we practice, what we're exposed to in the course of regular daily practice that I think is important. It becomes part of not just clinical care delivery. It's a part of why we created the course was the only course that we're aware of is lawyer driven and it's for lawyers teaching doctors. And to our knowledge, we haven't taken the course, but everyone that has that we are aware of essentially says it's really a legal course about the legal details and all the legal vocabulary. It wasn't some of the things that I'm talking about now such as these nuances around how to handle standard of care, what should we do? And the biggest part of this after you get into these engagements with lawyers and attorneys is the documentation. It's a big part of the work we've put together across a few of us who've done this kind of work for about a decade now is documenting and explaining how to think about these and what our experiences are because there is no, there is no standard of care for medical expert work. And so three attorneys will be okay with one thing. One attorney might be okay with another. And so we thought it was cool to kind of build out that community. And I think finally, the most important thing is just supporting physicians who want to do this work. And we'll be doing a lot more kind of service driven work to help them find potential attorneys, especially in certain specialties. It's a little bit less, it's less easy to access than if you're in a subspecialty like that. Yeah. I can imagine. Is it very specialty specific? How do you handle the differences between the specialties? Well, neurology is so specialty to begin with. And then the reason why I got involved in the spinal case is I've written research papers on this specific topic, spinal epidural abscess. Right. And so that's how I got engaged. I think there are many ways for one to get engaged in this kind of work. Even if you're a generalist, internist, or pediatrician, just picking and choosing the things that you care about, perhaps writing about them, and then building some reputation whether it's the guideline level with your society, perhaps, and other things you can do. So there's many ways to kind of become an expert that kind of go full circle, right? You are an expert because you're writing the guidelines or you're in your society. And then because you're writing about it, you kind of compound your expertise. So who put together this course? Who do you have teaching it? Yes, yeah, so Jorge Sanchez, myself, another <laughs> physician, Tenzid Shams, is going to be involved. And there'll be a whole panel of us kind of writing different lectures, doing Q&A that'll be released very short. Okay. And what's the price point for your course? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't decided yet. We want it to be affordable and it's our first go. So it'll be much cheaper than anything else we can find. That makes sense. It's hard to tell. And it's exciting to have you on as you are putting this course together and so that our listeners can maybe get in at the lowest price point that you yeah, might offer. It, it'll be under $2,000 and in our head, that's roughly, you know, one shift worth of work. We're putting together a lot of documentation. And the reason why I'm hesitating is we're also going to try to actually support the physicians in their first engagements. And so that's the question that we're trying to assess is if we're going to go reach out to lawyers on their behalf, should they want it as part of the course that mm -hmm. just has to cost. And so we're working through that mentally at this point. So once our listeners get involved in your course, we are a personal finance podcast, what is the structure of how people get paid as medical expert witnesses? And once they start working, is it a W-2 kind of offering? Is it a 1099? And can they perhaps use it as 1099 work where they can write off some expenses associated with it? So it's 1099 work. To my knowledge, it's not W-2. Okay. And in general, you don't want to look like someone who this is your full profession. That's kind of a bad look, right? In any right. In front of the yeah. jury. There are certainly people I've heard of who go around the country for a specific topic. One lawyer told me about an OB guy from somewhere in the Midwest who like they have one specific thing that they kind of are the expert for. And this is like what they go around the country, basically spending most of their time doing. That tends to be a bad look for all sorts of obvious reasons. Playing the system, it looks like you're pretty conflicted if this is what you do primarily. What juries obviously and what we would all want to see as a society is that you're doing this Occasionally, as part in it above and beyond your regular care of patient, mm -hmm. but then more specifically around topics that you are expert in, not just as your primary job. So it's, it's 1099 income. You can take deductions. All expenses, should you have to travel, are covered. And to the extent that you don't want to be in trial, one of the things we're talking about in the course is ways to build a practice, so to speak, around pre-trial reviews or pre-claim reviews, as we're calling it. All right. So there are 
options if you don't want to travel as well. That's good to know. Would your course be like an educational expense that you could write off against your 1099 income? Yeah, you'll be able to write it off and we'll have CME credits as well. All right. So we can also use our CME money to pay for the course, which is very nice. <laughs> and All right. So people that are employed, I'm thinking from a primary care or a hospitalist perspective, people that are employed that you know have shifts or have patients scheduled or have time that they committed, how do you go about explaining this to your employer that, hey, I'm a medical expert witness on this case and I might need to take some time off? I mean... Yeah, I know, yeah. I guess that's probably just what you say, but I can imagine there would be some stigma or hesitancy associated with that. Yeah, I think there can be, especially if you have a busy practice and you're, right. I think, like five days a week, most, you know, weekdays of the year. The challenge isn't the time. Usually trial dates are set well in advance. The real challenge in this country is that most trials get changed pretty rapidly and consistently. You might not know till the day before, which is a stress point. Similarly, you won't get paid if you're not going to trial, right? So if they cancel the trial, you've taken time off work, it's kind of lost income. And so that is a nuance to be mindful of. Usually when someone says there's a trial date, you know, months in advance, you can take the time off. The real difficulty, I think, is that if trials canceled, which is good, right? That means that we didn't involve so many jurors from the public and citizens and a whole you know, backlog the system if two sides can come to an agreement mm -hmm. and settle things. Usually that's what happens. So 99% of the cases don't go to trial. Most of them settle out of court, which mm -hmm. is what we all want, right? Mm -hmm. Most lawyers don't want to be litigators. They're different specializations for them. Someone is a litigator. You could kind of tell early on in your conversations with them. This is something we'll talk about too in the course. That's important for you to decide who you partner with on this type of work. If someone goes to trial 10, 12, 15 times a year, they like going to trial. That's part of their core business. That's not what most lawyers do. And so as you kind of think about who you, who you might partner with if you go down this journey, that's really important. That's really good to know. So many nuanced issues that I haven't thought about, about medical witness work that it sounds like you're going to do a good job training your students on that. And I'm really excited to see where, you know, you land as far as pricing and how you help your students going forward. What's going on at Physician on Fire? Let's change gears a bit and uh, tell us a little bit more about what else you're doing at Physician on Fire to support physicians. Yeah, yeah. It's been over a year. So let's talk about that. There's so much that's changed and we've grown pretty substantially. And initially it was tough. I think we would be pretty open about this and Leaf's written about it as well. You know, because so many people have an attraction to Leaf's writing and his writing is so good and witty and funny. Yeah. It's hard to replicate it. That was what we thought was going to be the challenge as well. And so I think now we found our stride. We have a whole cadre of writers that yes. are doing a generally great job. People seem to be engaging with them across various topics. That's been great. And then where we're headed is into creating more of this kind of course-oriented content so that physicians can learn about these types of things. And then where we'll go from here will be more explicitly into service categories. So what I mean by that is not just providing the content, but then supporting the next step. So nice. one, one of the challenges is great, Doc, you taught me how to do this, or I went to this weekend seminar about these things. What do I do next? And I think you and I have talked about this too. For example, maybe you would do financial coaching, getting your kind of certification as a CFP. I think for us, where that might go is a couple of categories. One, we might support doctors in the pursuit of these types of jobs, these types of side gigs, as we call them. Mm -hmm. And so we're working actively to find ways to partner with physicians and employers on this, not only for medical expert as a small bucket, but the more broad that you can imagine being an advisor to a tech company or similar. And mm -hmm. so that's the journey for us next year is leaning more into services because doctors want to. So we've already met with a few physicians just last week who are looking for something pretty unique. And I think because of our experience, having bridged the gap from clinical to technology to other types of psyche, just by way of experiences and that being super intentional about it, it's just kind of the way life has taken us as a group, we'll probably find ways to support people and replicate. Because Jorge and I and the team of Physician of Fire, we often get asked, how do I transition out? I'm tired. I'm burned out. I want to take a break. And even if it's not a negative thing, people will often ask us in a more aspirational way, how do I do more? How do I get involved in this cool stuff like AI or well, similar? And so I think we're uniquely poised to support physicians in that journey. And that's going to be the next thing. 
I love that, you know, we talk a lot about saving money on this podcast, but it's also very important to have diversification of income and multiple income streams. And it sounds like you are making it more possible for physicians to pursue and, and get those multiple income streams. And I'm really excited to see what you guys do next. Can you tell our listeners where they can find more information about your medical expert witness course? Yep. But we'll give you a link in the show notes to sign up. We'll yeah. host a webinar on it soon just to kind of talk through some of the details and our journey in more detail with Jorge and I and the team. It'll be on the website, physicianonfire.com. We'll link you there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for introducing us to this very interesting topic and opening our eyes to other ways we can use our expertise to help not only our patients, but also our colleagues or the legal system sort out some of the more challenging problems that we face as a society. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Disha. Oh, before I let you go, I got to ask you, what's your next photography trip? Are you still doing the photography? I have not been able to just because of time commitments with the kids. You know, I've yeah. got two and a four-year-old. And so we've been, we're, we're going to try and go out to Rainier in Washington. Okay. In the next few weeks, but it won't be a photo trip. It'll be more of your typical hiking. Look at the wildflowers, look at the mountains. Kind of thing. Oh, sounds lovely. Well, enjoy and thank you again for coming on. Dr. Shah, I thought some of the insights you shared on medical expert witness work was really enlightening and definitely opens up my mind to another possibility of how we can put our skills to use for the greater good. And I hope you guys learned something as well. Please make sure to go check out the position on fire and the link to the course and how to sign up will be in the show notes. Again, we do not have an affiliate relationship with position on fire yet, but we might in the future. But for right now, Dr. Shah is still putting this course together. If you have any thoughts, anything you'd like him to cover in the course, make sure you reach out to us and we'll forward it over to Dr. Shah. He is doing that webinar and that link will be in the show notes as well. The webinar is going to include more details on what they're going to be having in the course. If this is something that you are interested in and feel like you are an expert in your field, then go ahead and check that out and share your thoughts with us. Remember, it's not about waiting for the right moment. It's about creating it. If this conversation has resonated with you, make sure you share this podcast with who could use a little inspiration to start designing the life that they truly want. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, stay frugal, y'all. Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or catastrophic event could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Physician-founded and physician-focused, Pearson Rabbits builds human connections before they create quotes. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on your journey to safeguarding your future. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisor, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.